I am currently not. There we go. We are live now. Okay, so welcome to Virtual Gary Khan, and this is Alyssa Payton, and we have Mr. Stephen Troll Lord himself from Troll Lord Games, and we have KC Rift as well. And thank you, gents, for joining. So, um. I thought what we could do today is a um, a look at the Gaxmore map that I completed um, towards the end of last year. This map was done for Troll Lord Games, and um, I think it came out really good. But instead of me sort of showing you my drawing techniques, what I wanted to do was actually show you how I got to what you see today. Um, so... What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to flip to the original map that um, I got from the Troll Lords themselves. And I'm going to I'm going to walk us through what my thought process was for transforming that map into what you see. This is going to be a free form discussion. I uh, feel free to ask questions about our techniques, uh, what we thought about at a certain time, how we accomplished a certain thing and so on and so forth. Um, Shall we, gents, shall we get into this? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to turn this off. And this is where we started with Gaxmore. Now, this, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. This is the original. Steve, Stephen, can you tell me a little bit about the original map? Like who created it and so on? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Like they almost the isometric style, okay. So this has gone through some iterations here then. <laughs> I'm being told that People can't hear you. Yeah, but I can hear you. And I've got my game capture on here. The headphone capture. Uh, well, I don't, I don't think you must have done anything. Um, no audio for them. Alright, well, technical problems. Um... Let me just well now now we're seeing the, the, the cogs here, but um I mean I like if you speak right now Yeah we got output game right here Ah 
All right, well, that's fantastic. Casey, walk me through this, because you can probably see what I'm doing here. Yep. Do I see the speakers? Ah, so here, the headphones. My headphones are not actually picking it up. They... Um, oh, I've just got audio output voice, audio output gain. I can add another one. Sorry about this, folks. Um, yeah, you see um, the headphones. Sorry about this, folks. Well, can we add a audio source? Add the source. Add. And, I mean, th theoretically, if I can hear you, I mean... Oh. Ah. Oh, oh input, input capture, right. right. Audio output. Add. Let's, let's, let's do, do a new, new one. Try voice. Okay, that's, yeah. And then you want to output it too. I would think you'd see something like OBS or. Uh, well, try that. What is that uh, Realtek digital output? Well, audio output capture is now going. People hear me in the stream now. Someone said there is KC, so they might. He is good. Right. Magic. Can you hear me? Good magic. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I haven't actually done anything yet. Well, should I just cancel that? I think I think we're good. They can hear me, Don't and they can it. hear Don't KC. Touch it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't touch anything. <laughs> Do I have an echo? No one's saying anything. I think we're good. Didn't do anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> that was weird. Okay, well, here we go again. <laughs> Steven, walk us through. Uh, you had no audio at the beginning. Well, if you could, let's add begin. Um, walk, walk us through, uh, Stephen, the original map that you said was an isometric, and then who did this map, and the timing of it. I'll do it. Okay, so what you're looking at right now is a map by Peter Bradley, but that's not the original map that was done for Gatsmark. I'm going to walk you guys back just a little bit, uh, back to 2000, when uh, Troll Lord Games first signed with Gary Gygax. Uh, part of all of that was the lost city of Gaxmore, this adventure that Luke and Ernie had written. And when I got into it and started reading it, it was absolutely awesome old school stuff. It was really good stuff. But it was written for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So Luke, I believe it was Luke, uh, converted the whole thing over. And it, somewhere, and as I was saying earlier, they gave me a map uh, of Gaxmore. And it's going to have been drawn by either Luke or Ernie. I, I can't tell you who. It is no doubt in the TLG warehouse, folded up in an envelope somewhere in a box, you know, jammed in a corner. Hopefully it's still around. 
But the original map that was done and sent to the printers, the only thing I have left is this Dr. Pepper stained <laughs> map. This it's hard to really get the a, a good view. That's of beautiful, it. though, man. That's a work of art. Yeah, he did. Dave, Dave Zins did a fantastic job. And there's, I don't really understand how the blue lines work. Alyssa, you may know, but this is a transparency, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, really cool stuff. But uh, that was the D20 version of Gaxmore. That came out in 2001. Now, fast forward a few years to about 2010. I don't know, something like that. And uh, we did a Castles and Crusades version of the Lost City of Gatchmore, and Peter Bradley, I asked him to not do an isometric map. Uh, Peter Bradley is our uh, art director here at Troll Games. He's been here forever. Uh, so he did a kind of a standard map with the numbers and that you can see, and that's the map that you're looking at on the screen, and that's the one that I turned over to Elisa when we did the Kickstarter last year. Uh, when, I saw, when I saw your work, Elisa, I was just floored, and I thought, this is Man, we just got to marry these two up for, for the Lost City. This would just be beautiful. Uh, so she asked for my latest map, and that's that's what she got, the one that Peter Bradley did there. Well, I, I thank, A, thank you for inviting me to do this. This is one of my most favorite projects I've ever done. Um, so did, did Peter then sort of take this map uh, and base it off the isometric one? I mean, was he literally looking at the isometric version and kind of marking where all of the buildings were, or did he kind of reinvent it? It, no, I'm pretty sure that he, I, I told him to get looking at it right now. He stayed true to it uh, as much as he could. There were a couple of uh, small snafus, and I asked him to build terrain into it because in the second edition of it, or second printing, CNC version, whatever, uh, I had written a small intro piece that gave uh, players the opportunity to kind of play into Gaxmore, like a 10-page adventure that they do these little things and then they stumble on the Lost City. So I needed terrain around it. So Peter drew the terrain around it. It's kind of really, give it lost valley type of thing. It, it's really nice. I I, I really actually um, liked having this as a visual reference for sure. Um, so one of one of my challenges um, occasionally that I get is when you know someone like yourself, Stephen, gives me a map and says, "Hey, this is this is this is almost canon." right at this point and I, it's not like i could throw it all out to just draw what i want i've got to i've got to follow canon it has to still feel like gaxmore so this ended up being uh, what i would consider to be almost like a trace layer so what uh, as we're going to go through this i'm going to uh, keep coming back to this and we're going to see that i i wanted to copy where we had the terrain I wanted to copy where we had uh, the swamp, the marsh, the the eastern um, off uh, the water flow there, um, and the shape of the city and the size of the city and where those key buildings were at too, without ending up being an exact duplicate because that would defeat the whole purpose. Um, <laughs> So I, I guess, uh, and Casey, let me know if anyone obviously has any questions as we go through this. But I'm gonna, I'm just gonna click forward, and I'm gonna start showing now how I took this map, and we'll keep coming back to it, and ended up with the fully coloured version that I did last year. This is where I started. Ta -ta. Hey, Alicia, yeah, at least I will tell you that you, Peter Bradley is a very good photographer. He does a great job, but. Since you and I worked on this Gaxmore project last year, his primary thing is art. He paints, you know, and does the covers and all the interiors. But frequently now when we're talking and I say, hey, Peter, I need a mat. Frequently he'll say, you know, you could ask Elisa if she's free. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, I, I, I need to meet Peter. That, that's a really kind thing to say. Um, I, I will say, I mean, if you, if you look at this, I... I can't, I followed his work very closely, you know. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, this is where I started, by the way. I started with the walls. Um, and you can see that I, I basically... It, and by the way, just taking a step backwards, I draw digitally. Uh, I have a Wacom tablet. It's 24-inch HD touch. It's a monitor. I play Borderlands 3 on it at night, and I'm mapping during the day. Um, literally just with the pen. It's uh, My original uh, medium was ink on paper, so this was a very natural sort of transition for me to move this way. And you can see that. Um, what I've done in Photoshop is I drew the walls in grey, and then I drew 
bigger walls in black underneath and then if I actually erase the grey I start getting that battlement and I always start with the shape of the city always because that that way that that's my containing area even if the city spills beyond and Gaxmore does that this is it's like my canvas at this point and for some reason I started with Peter's water runoff at the south here um and just started drawing some of the outside terrain. Now this is where we start having fun. This is, the, I, I decided with this, uh, normally, actually, honestly, normally I draw my forestry and everything last. But there was so much about the original Peter map here that I think is defined by... The, the, the shape, the terrain that you were talking about, Stephen. I mean, you can see I wanted to keep the general position of our forestry. I wanted to um, uh, get the, the, the actual sort of, um, even some of the bushes and everything that he, he had in place. Um, because all of it, I think, ends up being the frame for where all of the buildings and everything are. My biggest challenge, though, and I was Twitch streaming this at the time, is... I wanted to be careful I didn't just copy the original map. You know, you'll actually see that I've got a lot of the trees like here, around here. A lot of the trees are even in, in the exact same position. And I always remember going, I, if I'm not careful, I'm just going to duplicate the original. But at the same time, I want to pay homage to the original. So that was one of the challenges that I had here. Well, I, of, uh... you, did a, you did a really good job. Sorry, Casey, didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I was just going to say out of curiosity on your um, uh, layering, I noticed that your, your trees all popped up on one, one layer. You tend to keep your walls and infrastructure, then your buildings, and then your your flora and fauna on a, I guess, fauna on a, uh, on different layers. Or how do you how do you normally go about layering and keeping track of stuff? No, I do. And now in the past, I've gone like a little over the top with my layers. I don't do that now. There was a, a map a long time ago where I ended up with no joke, like 3,000 layers, um, and it started to wreck my machine. I don't do that now. I try to keep things really simple, but I do. I put. I tend to put my battlements and walls on one layer, and so I can draw buildings separately, and if I mess up with some of the buildings, I can erase them with, uh, without affecting my walls. Same with fauna. I put all my fauna on its own layer, and I tend to call it like terrain, because in that way, if I want to touch up my terrain, I'm not affecting my walls, and I'm also not affecting my buildings. So yeah, fauna, walls, buildings, and then you're gonna see this later, roof details, I do on their own separate layer as well. Those are my main four, and honestly, this was my trace. I actually just called it trace, and why you're seeing it a little bit um, transparent here is because I actually, will draw on the top of this and I want to be able to see it bleeding through without it being a distraction. So yeah, it was about this point where I was like, um, I am literally copying every single bush and tree that was on the original. I should probably try to break away from that a little bit, otherwise I'm going to give Troll Lords back a different version of exactly the same map. And they're not going to be happy with that. Um, here... This is where I started adding my, um, I'm going to turn this on and off. I want you to, see, you to see the difference. I've got all of the trees drawn and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. The trees are just little clouds. If you look at it, they're just like little poofy shapes. And I tend to then add these little tiny details, predominantly in the lower right corner. I consider that to be my sort of shadow zone, lower right. But then, this is how I do my hills. And the whole thing about Gaxmore is it, it's on a hill. It's on a plateau, right? Right, yeah, yeah. It's up. It's elevated somewhat. So you see it when, when you're approaching from the... What, what I eventually uh, did and for the World of Arid when you place it, it's, it's basically the Lost Valley. You, you're going up to it and you see the walls of this thing on this plateau. This this was one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the most fun areas to actually draw. You know, and... Normally on my Twitch stream, I will show you how I'm doing that. That's not. The, I wanted to change the format of this, uh, go more through to a completed product. Uh, but you can see how I'm doing my elevations. I'm just, uh, and I got this by the way from an old. I think it's a 19th century map of Boston, and uh, in the hills around Boston, they've got these dashed 
lines. And if you basically do the elevation that way, at the top of those dashed lines, that's the top of the hill or the rise, the bigger the line, the harder it looks, it's a bigger a, a drop. But if you do it softer and shorter lines, they look more just like little hills. Yeah, and I, kind I, of wavy hills. Wavy hills, exactly. And here, this is, I mean, I'm going to just go back to Peter's map again. If you'll notice these, I use Peter's map for a lot of uh, guideline for where these hills should be located. You know, I have to tell you, because uh, I have such a, a strong historical background, I did, I got my undergraduate and did my master's degree in history, and I was working on my PhD when I started TLG and eventually abandoned that. Uh, but I, I read a lot of military history, and in fact, in, in the other room, I've got West Point's complete collection of the American battlefields, you know, and it, it does all of this. So those little lines that you're that you're drawing there, it was so comforting to me when I saw those. When you first sent that stuff over, I thought, oh, look, she's done the elevation just <laughs> like West Point does. <laughs> it's such a delightful, simple style. And when you start doing it, these like hard lines like these here, uh, and you just start building it up, it, they almost like look ugly and very basic and crude. But when you actually start layering them up from here and you come up a little bit and you come up a little bit and maybe you start actually adding a little bit of shape in here suddenly you start to see hills it, and i love it this, this is my style I, I i wouldn't do anything else now it's it's absolutely awesome and when you're running a game it's going to help so much because you know the, the gym's going to be able to look at it and say oh they got to climb this hill here and then climb this cliff or a ridge or whatever yeah, you can literally see the little paths in between hills and things. So I, I, I do, this is a style that I really like. I, I didn't know it had that effect on you. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> very, very comforting for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, so now. Now I'm going to jump forward a little bit. You may be going, okay, so what's changed in between iterations here? By the way, each of these that I'm showing you is about one session. Each of these is about a two-hour chunk. So going from, like, there to there, that I think that was about two hours to do that. It was a pretty tedious two hours, but it was a two-hour chunk. And then, um, then what you're going to see next is there's a little bit of detail that I start to add over here. And uh, you're going to see the graveyard. I loved working on this graveyard. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit in here. Um, and you're going to notice a couple of things. One is, you see this scale bar? I got asked about scale yesterday. Like, do I, or do I consider scale? And I do. There was an original scale on Peter's map, so I took that, and this here is actually his scale. And then I wanted to use this to make sure that the scale of my key locations in the graveyard were correct. Oh, nice. The other thing here is, um, I actually, I think I still have the book here. I do. Look, right next to me. I, this became my Bible right here. Uh, I would go through the individual locations from the original map. And I, on stream, I would be reading out a particular location, you know, so uh, uh, and to make sure that I was capturing it correctly. And so they would be like, uh, and I would always, uh, uh, no spoilers, and I would stop short of the actual encounter. But I read every single location here to make sure that our shape and position and later on our coloring of these were all correct. This is where I think I first started to deviate from um, um, Peter's map a little bit. Like you can see that I've got the key locations mostly the same, but my shapes start to differ. My shapes start to differ quite a bit. And this like you, I think there was a description here of this tomb having stairs going up either side. And I don't think um, Peter's original had that. So this is where I start to actually spread my wings a little bit and start to actually do my thing. It's that layer of detail really though, that draws everybody in. When Peter did his, I asked him to do, you know, a pretty technical layout. So it's kind of like a dungeon. 
Uh, but what you've done is taken that clearly and moved it into a, a map that the CK can use. You know, he doesn't have to describe it, but they can if they want to. They can use your map as perfect reference. Right, right. I like um, I, I, I like to actually build stories and personality into my maps a little bit. I, I Actually, the more technical it is, the more I struggle with it. So this is where you'll start to see uh, I start adding those little stories and bits of personality that aren't even necessarily part of the descriptions. Yeah, you showed me that one in the uh, arena, I guess, or the... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get back to that later. I'll show everyone. So here, the, uh, the, between these two, this is where I just start going nuts with the detail. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. So I, what I've done is I've kind of drawn the shape of what I want my graveyard to be. I've done my main key locations, the numbered locations on the map. Uh, I read from the actual scenario to make sure that I had the correct dimensions, if dimensions were uh, stated. So nothing on my map is different than the actual description says. Uh, but then if the description talks about stairs up front or a door at the front or two walls, uh, to actually that you have to go past to get to it. That's what I drew. And then then I just went with the detail. And this is how I draw my graveyards. It, it, it's honestly, it's a texture thing. Um, but I, I think this one here actually talked about statues around it or something like that. And you'll, you'll start to see that I've added roof details now. Um, and uh, oh, the roof details were actually drawn on a separate layer. We'll see that later on because I actually turned them red. And then I started coming up here. And that was another named location right there. Um, I think, what was it? The, the Whispering Horse or something like that. What's it called, Stephen? I have to look that up. I think that's area C9. Is that where, where are you pointing to? This one on the road? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's on the A twenty seven. This one, like the Prancing Horse Tavern or something like that. That that was weird, the first key building. Respite Inn and Stable. There you go. There you go. So uh, yeah, that and that's one of the wonderful things that I love about this map. By the way, this is like it's it's in a war zone. It's been besieged. There's a lot of it that is in ruin because of that. Even areas that have been burned down. But then you've got these. Buildings are actually intact and still good and they're occupied. Yeah, the, the whole the whole purpose in, in Gaxmore, of course, is that it's it's a sandbox setting. It's an old city that has that was pulled out of the prime material plane and thrown into an extra dimensional space. And there it slowly eroded and degraded over time until it was most of its citizens were dead. And then it was returned to the prime in this kind of, you know, jumbled state of, like you said, a war zone. That's the absolute perfect way to describe it because there's factions fighting for power. And uh, it's, yeah, it's filled with everything you want in a sandbox setting without a doubt. This building here, by the way, this is where I start getting into the detail. Uh, this building here, the description actually talks about that uh, part of the building's ruined Part of the building is not, and there's a staircase that can be barely visible going up towards the back part of the building. So I drew in the staircase. I started to have fun with this map. It, it started to get a little bit nuts. I got to tell you, that's brilliant right there. <laughs> that's brilliant. How far, when you're when you're drawing, how far are you zooming in? Just out of curiosity, when you're when you're going, were you in about that far when you're about there? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I zoom in this deep. Um, sometimes deeper, like there's a dead guy in the arena that, you know, I zoomed way in for that. But, um, no, about here, this is about my draw sort of zoom. And that's one thing I love about digital, by the way. It, it, yeah, yeah. it, it really, uh, and I didn't expect this when I went digital, but it, it kind of frees you up to really, um, experiments. You, you know, if you make a mistake, you can erase it. You can zoom way in if you want to get that extra detail. And you can't do that with ink it, it, either way. So this, when I went digital, it actually, I think, made me a better mapper because I could, like, really just take challenge, uh, take risks, you know? Um, but, yeah, you're, you're going to see that this is where just things start going crazy. So I'm, I'm going to turn this on and off again just so you can see what we did here. Um... This is the original part of this. 
and these locations are describing, uh, you know, ruined buildings and things like that, and this is where I took it. So we've got our key location, and we've got a key location here, and then this whole area, I think it's described as just ruined buildings, burned out buildings, and the, I, I really had fun drawing ruins on this map. And there's no cut and copy in or anything like that. This, this is me just being a little bit touched in the head because you can see we just start <laughs> going nuts. So is this, uh, Steve, is this progressive in time? Because uh, I noticed that the older map was uh, a little more, a little less battle-worn. So is this later, 20 years later now, is this later in Gaxmore's history? No, it's the, it's the same time frame. It's just, it kind of shows, one, the maturity of TLG's vision of what we're doing. And the original one, as it was written and conceived by, by Luke and Ernie, it's, uh, you know, they focused on the, the, the graveyard was a huge thing, the inner city and the outer city. Uh, and I think we threw in at that point the um, statues too, but there's like a, a little bit of underground stuff. Now there's more underground stuff came later. And then fast forward 10 years on, and when Peter's working on the map, that's when, you know, I'm, I'm more detail, more detail. And then, of course, when we do this latest one with you know, all the collective knowledge I have now and what we're capable of doing. And then when I saw what Elisa was doing in other maps, uh, I was like, okay, I want just more that's than in the text. And that's the nice thing about the map that Elisa's created here. I can play each of the encounter areas, but those ruined areas out there aren't actually going to be in the text. That's going to be up to the GM to, you know, flesh out and do whatever they want. I think there's a brief description in it, Elisa, but not much. I mean, it's, and that's A26. Yeah, abandoned wooden shacks is all there is. And there's, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's so that's kind of the nice thing about, I mean, not nice, it's an amazing thing what Elisa's done here is taking this and given the end user, whoever's playing this stuff is going to have even more to game with than they actually get in the book. So it's it's a win-win. Yeah, I, I want GMs to have more than just a text to go off, and I want players to go, well, what's that? And you're going to see a lot of that later on. Um, I even here did a little tiny pier or something. I, I imagine someone was fishing there once upon a time, you know? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> And that, that's, that's what I honestly like to do with my maps is I want them to feel like they're actually lived in. Yeah, you know. Uh, personality you were talking about. Personality, earlier. yeah, exactly. Uh, no, okay, hopefully no one's living in the uh, ruined shacks here. But the, <laughs> you, you, it's one step away from, I want, it's got to be believable. I want people to see in their mind's eye, someone used to fish here. Because now, now, now it has... A plausibility now it has that sense of life to it uh, and that's that's what i try to do with my maps um what you're going to see as we go through these iterations is i actually sweep anti-clockwise i think pretty much all the way around here and so i'm going to head towards the north and so this you'll see right here there's two things going on here and i'll zoom in on this one is, I love, apparently, drawing ruined walls, and this was the map for it. I have so much fun, and you'll notice it's basically right on top of the wall. I ended up just erasing sections, drawing in all of the scattered, uh, scattered boulders and rocks and stuff. I imagine the rocks actually tumbling down the hill, so that's I did the predominance of it there. But we started to sweep up to this area right here. And you'll notice I bring my little scale bar with me all the, all the time just to make sure my buildings match the description. Oh, no, that's brilliant. This, this here um, is a named location. I forget exactly what it is, but it actually has the dimensions in the book. Some of these buildings, Stephen, have maps actually in the book as well. So I made sure that I was matching those in layout. Oh, that's really cool. That's good. I mean, that's amazing. That is the huge brick building, area A. <laughs> <laughs> your 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 uh, picture is more detailed than the description. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, most of these encounter areas that you'll see have about two paragraphs, maybe three, but this one 
with the most common name, huge brick building, is a page and a half. So <laughs> I guess there's a lot going on in the huge brick building. There, there is. I, I remember there being a lot going on inside the huge brick building. Um, I made sure that it matched the dimensions. I think I remember uh, with this one, um, thinking that it would be really interesting if there was a courtyard in the middle. Because I thought like a GM could really run with that, you know? And then this here, I'm not going to name these buildings because I remember this encounter, but yeah, th this was another area. Um, I think it's got one label that basically is for all of these. And you'll notice we've got more ruins coming up here too. Now, I'm going to actually just bring Peter's back. back. You'll see, I haven't done A17 yet, but there's our brick building. And there's A19 right there. So I'm, try I'm making sure that, at least in spirit, I'm keeping everything where it should be. If it has a certain size, I keep the size. Um, but otherwise, I'm just running with it at this point. Sure. Then here, and I'll zoom in for a moment. So we're sweeping around the top of the map. I've added the other location, this A17, right there. And that is an orchard, I think. Or oh, there's an orchard based at the back of it right here. So let's zoom in on that. We did have a question in chat. Yeah. Real quick. How yeah. much time was spent uh, collaborating back and forth between you and, uh, I guess, the last iteration? Or was there any? I, I don't think there was any. Um, Stephen sent me across the descriptions, the original map. There's actually a great map in the back of this, too, that I would reference a lot. Almost everything that I need is in there. I think there might have been once or twice, Stephen, I wrote to you and said, you know, I, the description says this, but the map does this. Is it okay if I do this? I think there was a couple of times like that. But you and I were not really talking that much, were we? No, not too much. I think there was one missing number, if I recall, a something or the other, six or nine or something. Uh, but yeah, we didn't talk too much. It's one I don't, I try, you know, we work with quite a few artists and I try not to... Uh, interfere with what you guys do because I, I so far as art's concerned I can look at something and I don't call like it but beyond that I don't know anything about it so. <laughs> yeah you and me both <laughs> with this with this particular you know so I'm not going to sort of name names of previous projects but there are some projects that you get where the description isn't particularly good or it you know contradicts itself a lot or it's just highly implausible you know i'm gonna have a lot more conversation on things like that but here troll lords they gave me a map they gave me a book of descriptions that pretty much answers everything i need you know there, there was like one missing label i think like that um so uh, but otherwise there it all is so this was, this was easy and this was fun because like I say, I would sit here on Twitch and I would just read out the description and go, okay, well, let's draw that then, shall we? And that, that, that was just so much fun. It really was. I did have kind of a follow-up to that then uh, with projects maybe like this or, or previous projects, uh, you as the mapper, do you ever feel restricted in what you can add as far as those little extra bits that you're talking about? So, so you talked about that a little bit already with the, the dock appear on the little pond and that sort of thing but do you ever feel restricted stuff you want to do but can't yeah yeah no that's a really good question um and this map almost ran afoul of that in a way um and it's one thing that i continually had to keep coming back to my um vision right when you've got a great map like this for a product that is out there this is canon at this point and there may be certain things on this map that i don't necessarily agree with whether it be the positioning or the size of something but now i've got this canon thing i can't just completely change it and they can actually be some of the hardest projects to do uh, in a way because i must follow what this other person did i, I think even in spirit i must do it even if i think it's wrong you know, and that, that's where I, if I feel very strongly about it, you know, I, I, would, I would talk to Stephen and I would say, can I do this instead? And I'd maybe give him an example. But they they could be restrictive, but at the same time also the easiest. You know, it's this weird dichotomy. And this, this was such an example, but I think I started to find my legs on this. Um, 
because, because it's, it's like, like okay, I get this. Um, A18. Um, I forget exactly what A18 is, but um, I'm going to draw it differently. I'm going to make sure it's the right spot on the map, but I'm going to just draw it differently. And then if, if there was something, and I'll show you later on, there's an amphitheater, there are aqueducts, there was our, uh, you know, there's a pyramid. I'm, I'm going to make sure I get the dimensions right, and I'm going to make sure I get them in the right location. So I think I managed to find a nice happy middle ground with it. You certainly did. And that is, just so the viewers know, A18 is the cluster of dilapidated huts. <laughs> so there you go. And they are dilapidated. They are dilapidated. They definitely are. <laughs> this this area here was actually fun, no, too. Um, the, this, more ruined buildings, but like there's this old marketplace out here, too. And again, no spoilers, but I ended up drawing little carts. It looked a little dilapidated. Some of the tents are completely collapsed. So the, uh, there's one tent that's actually set up against uh, an actual ruined building. So I thought that would be kind of cool to draw. Um, this pops later on when I start showing you the coloring on it. It just it, it, it just looks so beautiful on the map, like a little jewel, even though it's kind of mostly dilapidated. Then we start absolutely just really motoring now. There's a few locations here. This one is a named location right here. And we've got a pit here. More details on that later because that's actually a refuge pit. So we had fun with that. And then this is where we started getting a little bit nuts because this is not on the map. But I, one thing I love to do with my forests is let's have all sorts of roads and little paths and things going through them. And then just drop a hut in the middle of nowhere. Drop a hut in a clearing. Because some player somewhere is going to go, what's that? Oh, I don't know. GM, you tell me. And here, this was, uh, the, actually, I remember this Twitch stream. Because uh, I think, actually, this, again, no spoilers, this is a hut. And it is described as propped between two other buildings that are leaning up against it to ruin. So that's what this is. And this here then completed that section, and I'll actually just turn on again. You can see I've got the same spirit, and we've got A3 here. But now, now I'm beginning to really sort of get into the groove. You can see that we've got some ruins here, but I was like, ah, no, I don't, I don't want to put ruins there. I'm going to do them a little bit differently. So this is where this, I think, starts to really have the, the hallmark of me, even though the shape of it is obviously the original. Now I'm going to zoom out. There's a couple of things about this. I'm going I'm to just flick this on and off. So we've gone from heavily working the outside to having this section done and this section done. Uh, I think this was more like a four hour jump here. There's a couple of things. Notice the red roofs now, because I'm drawing the roofs on a separate layer and I basically gave it a filter effect of red because it's very easy to be drawing on the wrong layer and do all my roof details on the building layer. And that kind of messes things up. So you'll see that these are red, but it's just a filter effect. I turn it to black later on. This, this was a lot of fun to work on, Stephen. Do you want to tell us about this, the tannery? Okay. That is the tannery. So that should, I was just looking at that. That is the this, this tannery and slaughterhouse in the southwest corner of the map. And it's actually so large in Gaxmore. I'm going to have to find its page number. It has its, essentially Gaxmore's broken up into several portions. There's the... The outer Gaxmore, which is, of course, uh, I, I, there's outside the walls, the crypts, these dilapidated huts, the stuff that you've been talking about. And then the inner city, which or the outer city, which is right inside the walls. And then the inner city, which your map will show pretty soon. Uh, but the tannery is a place all of its own uh, wedged out there next to the, I guess, the edge of the escarpment, for lack of anything else. But uh, it's kind of a critical thing. It's kind of a big deal, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 this key location. Doesn't have a number, has a name, and I think it's yep. described as looking like a fortification. It's got complete walls all the way around it. This is why one area actually, Stephen, where I did take a risk because I didn't like the original shape on the original map. Um, if I may bring it up, 
that that's that's the tannery on the original map and i didn't like it i wanted to do something a little bit different something that felt like it was a fortress that it was fortified I had the same buildings, but I wanted to do them in a different way, and I wanted to draw them differently and have different shape to them. Well, and honestly, that uh, that less symmet for me that less symmetrical look makes it feel a little more realistic too. Draws me in a little bit more. We started yeah, getting nuts in this one. The nice thing that you've done here, if you look at, uh, and I, when watching you flip back and forth, toggle back and forth between maps, I just thought of a really good idea that I want to talk to you about later. I don't want, I don't want to forget about it. We can do something. I got, I got an idea. But when you look at any, any kind of structure that's going to be built in the Middle Ages, it's not going to almost immediately build this wall structure. It's almost, it grows, right? And really even in today's society. So you can see here where maybe they first built this L-shaped building and then they needed more warehousing spaces and then they needed a slaughter pen. Well, they're getting a lot of thieves in here, so we better wall this thing. So we needed a shed over here and blah, blah, blah. And that's what you've done here. Good. Uh, that's one thing I try to do is make it feel like there was purpose behind it. And if there was growth, that it feels like there was some growth. Um, because of some of the way some of the descriptions uh, or some of the description for this location is, is phrased, I also started to add these um, outer walkways that I felt were added later as part of the fortification, so they're like these little ramps and balconies and stuff. But like this area, I think is the slaughterhouse. Um, so I thought that maybe they would have old pens out the front, you know, for this. And if they had that, maybe they actually had some fields and a cattle area at the back. So I added that. This is actually, I think, um, a workshop. So I added all sorts of little workshop benches and things like that too. And I've got my carts and my logs and things like that. And the little stairs coming up onto the walls. It ended up being a real fun area to work on. This is, though, then where we're getting into the city proper. And I'm going to zoom to that just for a moment. Um, just a couple of things. You'll notice that I've marked off the roads. Now, here are the original roads. And I tend to do my roads a little bit differently when I draw. Um, but I always mark the main roads. There, there must be no buildings along this path, so to speak. And so what I did is I took the spirits of the original map and I marked those roads. But I also, I, I kind of did a little bit of a deviation because I don't think that the original had too much of this going on. And if there's going to be some kind of like uh, arena up here, then there would be like a plaza around it. So I'm kind of marking that off. I know that there was going to be a hippodrome here. So I marked that off. And then I always remember I was I, I deleted some roads and I redrew them just to create a nice interesting shape that felt like someone would could come in through this gate, walk through the city, and like come out the other side if they needed to. So I deviated a little bit, but I kept a lot of the originals the same. And what I'm doing here is literally saying, don't draw a building on that, Faden. That that's gotta be white space. And you'll see that starts to take shape here. I am drawing buildings. And between them, that no drawing space, so to speak, that's the road. You, you can see that here. Oh, and there's our pyramid that I spoke about before. The, the, so some people draw roads, and there's nothing wrong with drawing roads, like draw a black line right up here. That's fine. That works. But they, the maps start to look blacker, a lot heavier uh, with ink, so to speak. And they actually start to look a little bit more modern because you start to see like sidewalks and things like that. So I don't do that if, if this is an older map uh, or an older city, I just do the white space between buildings. And what I started to do is actually the named locations. I'm gonna zoom out real quick. Yeah, I never thought about that, but that's a good point. They didn't necessarily make roads. They just put buildings and kept a path clear. Right, and even the Romans, obviously, the Romans had roads, right? But yeah. um, did they have sidewalks and everything? Do I want it to feel like there's a sidewalk on every road? Or am I just going to flag this and later on you'll see that I flagged it and it looks great. It looks like good roads now. Uh, if I had actually done a line as well, it, it would just visually look too much. And it would honestly start to yeah. pull away from the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. What, and what I, I'm doing here is I literally went to every single named location, I read it out, and we drew it. Named location, named location, named location. And 
one of the wonderful things about this is Gaxwell has a very Roman feel. I mean, very Roman feel. So, I mean, and I'm a Romanophile. Uh, and so I, was, I wanted to make these named buildings um, feel Roman. And the big villas, villas have gardens, courtyards and things like that. And so you'll see that I do a lot of that. I'm adding these areas and I'm, I'm tiling the roofs. And then, of course, we've got the pyramid. Now, the pyramid was drawn differently in the original map. Um, it's kind of almost, it's, I think, the only building, Stephen, that's actually done side on. It's more of a symbol, uh, but because we want a proper pyramid here. And that ends up actually being coloured in a very interesting way from one of the guest writers. Oh, yeah, that's right. Who put, I can't remember which one put it into the, in the pyramid. I, I think it was Jeffrey, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Jeff? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, we are just goes. now inserting. I, I've got to get all those those numbers to you to put up. <laughs> <to put them. laughs> Anytime you're ready, you know I'm here for you. All right, now this this was another one. So we've got a, um, a named location. This is the um, um, amphitheater, okay? And it was originally drawn like this. Um, we went a little bit nuts with our amphitheater. The amphitheater is described in the text as being, I think the second largest building in Gaxmore. And when I was looking at the original here, I felt like, well, no, that's a very distant third, if not fourth or fifth. It looked too small. I wanted to have it presence. So one of the ways that we actually did that is I actually found this amphitheater that had these big, huge earth uh, walls going around it and these embankments. So that's what these are. And then I thought, well, even if this is now not the largest building, if I actually give it some grounds around it, then oh. um, now that its footprint is one of the largest in Gaxmore. So that that's what I ended up doing here. I just plopped it right into the middle of a nice big garden. That's a that's a brilliant save. If it wasn't, <laughs> if the, if the image didn't work out like you wanted to. The grounds absolutely. <laughs> So that's awesome. And I can, I can imagine people, and I actually purposely added these at the end, so like they are part of the amphitheatre complex. You come down the road, there's two little huts here, kiosks, maybe buy a little bag of popcorn or something, and make my way through the garden into the amphitheatre proper. The whole thing becomes the amphitheatre. Mm -hmm. And it ends up looking really good too when it's coloured at the end here. Now you're going to start seeing big, huge blocks getting filled in. And so right here, there's two things. One, notice how I, I've, I, I'm erasing my roads. The roads are another layer. Um, I'm erasing them as I go. And if I toggle that real fast, you see how even just a soft gray for the road actually kind of looks visually distracting. But if I actually erase it, it's just I, I just think it's easier on the eye. Oh, yeah, much, much easier. Um, Another name yeah, building here. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. It looks natural. I mean, when the, when you remove the gray, it looks very natural. Right. And there's still no trouble distinguishing the road, where the road's at, like you said. So, I, yeah, it looks great. Here, here I have drawn in the road because I've got no building to actually mark the edge. So you'll see that I will do it in places. But the nice thing about that, what you've done there is created what looks to be like a lawn that's not been taken care of. Right. And that's how we color it later on. Exactly. Um, this, by the way, the description says there's a dead horse and cart on the lawn, if I remember rightly. <laughs> <laughs> So, when you consider that in the book is probably going to be, what, something like this in size. I mean, it's just pixels. But if you ever wanted to print big posters of this, Stephen, the details are in there, okay? There it is. We're going to have to do that now. <laughs> well, there will be a large poster, so hopefully this all comes out. And, and I think here the description talks about the doors have been pulled off or something like that. So, I, I made sure that the map reflected that as well. And that was actually, honestly, I don't, outside of Teagle Manor, I don't think I've ever sat here, read a description and gone, okay, so this is what it needs to be. This, this, this 
Gaxmon map was so much fun in that respect. So much fun. It's like there's one location later on where it talks about a pile of dead bodies that obviously aren't on the original map. And I'm like, I'm drawing dead bodies. If it says there's a pile of dead bodies, I'm putting dead bodies <laughs> on this map. Well, that's, that's one of the nice things about Gaxmon, one of the things that appealed to me way back in 2000 when you read it, you know, and I tend to fall into this this trap when I'm writing an adventure. I put in so much background and history and stuff that at the end of the day, the GM probably doesn't need what they need to know is what's going on and what's in there they're going to kind of create their own background right and Gaxmore, it that's what it is it's got that old it just tells you what's there now go yeah and and you've captured that clearly yeah now this this area too i don't think i ever really spoke to you about this area here i'll bring up the um, original that i'm going off the original has this a b c d and this is the uh, water cistern area i believe uh, S25, but you've got a map in the book for this, um, and it has this layout, and it has four water systems to it. So I actually followed the original map, but then I destroyed one of these, um, I, 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 I'm not sure if they're granaries or something, but I destroyed one of these pretty heavily, so it was like it bridged the original map where there's three and the map that you've got in the book, which has four. So I'm like, I've got four as well, but I've also got three. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's funny. I never noticed that in playing in this map and looking the one in the book has it's silos. The one in the book does have four. Uh, and you've, you've captured Peter's placement of them in the book, not on the map, but in the book perfectly. And I got to tell you, you were talking about that rubble earlier. You know, I go way back. I started playing in 77 or something like that. And one of my favorite adventures of all time is, the, and it's in, in its original format, is T1, the Village of Hama. Uh, and forget all of Village that. Of Hama, yeah. If you go to the moat house and you look at the map of the moat house, it's that isometric and there's rubble everywhere. So it immediately captures your attention. And that's what you've, much like the hills where you've drawn lines, you've pulled me back to 1979 or 80, whenever that adventure came out. <laughs> it's, it's, again, that comforting thing. <laughs> I love rubble. I don't know why. I do too now, and I can't explain why. I had so much fun. I mean, look at these ruins with the like, the, the ruined walls and the rubble. Or even here where we've got fallen timbers where there used to be a roof support. I've had so much fun with this. I really did. Yeah, we probably shouldn't be comforted by rubble, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, and this too, this was like, and if we look at the original, uh, there's a little bit of rubble here, but the, the, the map, in my humble opinion, felt almost empty, like it wasn't this massive city once upon a time. So I've, I've kept these key locations, like S20 here. Um, obviously, I've drawn that exactly the same shape, exactly the same size. Um, but I'm surrounding it by rubble. But I, I don't want to make a whole bunch of buildings necessarily around it, but there's a suggestion that it used to be buildings before they got burned down. And that's the way it would be in any city, especially in the Middle Ages. There was not big open spaces in, in those towns. Right. Fill up everything they could inside the, inside the protection of the walls. Mm -hmm. um, question, Steve, is the digital map going to be full scale? Was a question. Yeah, we'll do as high resolution as Elisa sends it to us. And I think that's 600 DPI, isn't it? Yeah, something like, yeah. It's, it's a yeah. ridiculously large map. I Actually... just wanted to make sure they could see the horse and carriage. <laughs> it's all the details I hope that they will be able to see. <laughs> Stephen, I actually have a 50-inch print for you on canvas, by the way, that I'm going to arrange to ship to you. Um, oh, wow. Of, of this map. Uh, um, so... We need oh, to that make arrangements. Wonderful. Thank you. That will be mounted and on the wall. <laughs> 50 inches, I was like, he's going to see that dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> so I this... may have, honestly, I may have to look when we're, we're going to print this probably next month. I'm hoping uh, I'll look what the printers are able to do on size. What the original, I don't have a measurement. I think it's. Uh, I don't know if that's going to show up, but it's probably 22 yeah, you can by see it, right? 18. So hopefully we can get it bigger than that. Uh, oh, you will. You, you definitely will be able to, yeah. Um, all right, so this the, now I'm getting to the fun like, here. I mean, you can see that I start sweeping around. I'm doing the same sort of anti-clockwise shape. Here, by the way, this these two buildings here, 
this was so much fun. This here, um, I, I obviously I modelled it upon the Colosseum. Obviously. But then, you know, as a historian, Stephen, you will know that they used to have these big, huge masts coming out and they could actually pull, you know, a canvas across to keep people under shade. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm drawing them. I'm, I'm drawing that, what it might have looked like. And it was so much fun. And later on, when we see the coloured version of that, I think it came out really good. I think that the, I deviated from the description a little bit in doing this because I think the description says it's completely covered. But I thought if I do completely covered, we're not going to be able to see all of the goodies underneath. So I'm going to do partially covered. It has been covered by a patchwork tarp made from a disgusting amalgamation of hide, skins, and pelts. So it works well. <laughs> the patchwork, the patchwork that is a both. lot of pelts. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I'm drawing the arena, damn it! I'm not just covering the whole thing. That was that was a fun, fun little building to do, and you'll see. I just start filling in the outside here. I mean, if I actually just put, bring this back, S11 has a description, name building. This is how I actually drew it here. I'm going to zoom in just for a moment. This is the gladiator training area, and I know that because I did a Spartacus style little uh, fighting pit right here. And I always remember when I was drawing this one, Stephen, remember the original Spartacus with Kirk, God rest his soul, how right at the beginning we have Crassus come out and he's got his, like, his wife with him and they have Spartacus fight Numidian. So I drew yeah. the box right there. I was channeling Spartacus with this. And right here we've got the little practice dummies. <laughs> That's awesome. And the kitchens right here, including That's the bench right. that they pick up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, it's, it's funny, too, because I can remember that movie very well. <laughs> I wanted to say thanks, uh, Cobalt Press, for the ray. We just got another 56 viewers from Cobalt Press. They must have finished up. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. We are currently walking through the building of Gaxmore. And you just got to the bit where we're talking about Spartacus. Because that's the guy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and you'll notice too, everyone that's in the chat, you, you see occasionally I'm dragging my scale bar around, a beautiful thing too about, you know, working digitally. And I angle it and I make sure that I get the right size for the, the actual school itself. Um, and then I, I always remember reading that like when the gladiators would go out to the Colosseum, it was almost like a parade, right? So I built this nice little sort of road coming up to it and I lined it with trees, put a couple of statues at the end there. The statues are armed, of course. We've got a little trident guy right here. <laughs> I, I've clearly uh, not looked at the map close enough. <laughs> The wonderful thing about, uh, this sounds big-headed, it's not meant to be that way, but one of the things that I actually try to bring to my maps um, is a stupid level of detail, like to the point where you start to worry about my mental state. I've always been that way. But I, w I want you to honestly, you know, what, like years from now, Stephen, standing in front of the 50-inch version of the map or whatever and go, wait a minute, I want you to see things years <laughs> from now, you know? And th th this is this is what Gaxmore allowed me to do. We're going to keep well, sweeping. Let me, let me tell you, that's kind of funny. I, got, I don't know who this artist is, but what you're talking about is some of my favorite type of art. Now, this fellow wrote, he drew pictures back in the 60s. This one came out around the Vietnam War era. Let's try and get that in. But there is an absolute stupid amount of detail like you're talking about, just things when you look at this, this guy in an office, I don't know if you can see any of yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's coming through pretty good. Okay, but it's just a guy in a chair, and when you zoom in, there's just all kinds of forms and in and out boxes, and the, the detail is just astounding, and that's what you've done here with your little gladiator guy with a trident and the, <laughs> the, the dead horse in the front yard is amazing. <laughs> That, that, I, I grew up on that type of thing, to be honest with you. And I used to actually read 2000 AD, um, a comic back in England. It's still going. Uh, but some of the artists, particularly on uh, Simon Beasley when he was doing ABC Warriors, um, and Gibson on um, Halo Jones and that type of thing, or Robo Hunter, uh, every panel was this rich feast of little details that you would have to look and a little robot, you know, go, oop. 
drunk or, or something or a little robot falling off a ledge somewhere. And it, it, I think that's a, a lot of the influence for me in, in like trying to add these details and these stories with what I do here. Well, it certainly comes out. It certainly does. Um, one thing that I started to do too is I started to add some more tents, um, particularly around the Colosseum area. I figured that would be a thing, you know, merchant tents and that type of stuff. And we've got our water systems. Uh, and this particular one I decided to break. And I think it describes it as having stairs going down the inside. So we obviously drew those. Um, yeah, I'm going to give everyone a little spoiler. Those tents, once the color comes through, are awesome. But <laughs> that's coming soon in this stream, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting close now to actually beginning to show color. Now, you'll see there's a big jump there. Um, this here, I have, A, I drew in the interior now. I've kind of marked off. Okay, so this, this is where we're going to have, let's say, our palace grounds. And we'll come back to that. And here... We've got several named key buildings. I'll go back to the original here, like S61 right here. This building I actually did a little bit differently because of the way that it's actually described. Um, I think uh, uh, 49 is that building. The Nervous Guards is 49. You might be talking about the well-kept manor or are you talking about 49? Yeah, I think 49 uh, as a statue. Um, I actually put that one up on a plinth. I put it up in a temple area because I think the way that the, the statue is described. Um, all of these statues, by the way, you'll actually see that I start adding them here. On the original map, they're obviously, they're, they're the ones that have got the little star shape and just a number. No S, just a number. Every single one. And what I did is I actually went through all of the statues. And if they had a particular description, that's what I drew. If there was a particular description, and I think this one, I felt, no, this statue is big, it's special, it needs to be more in a park area, up on some steps, maybe some pillars going around there. What is that? Is that number 49? I think it's 49. Yeah, that's, if pigs had wings. <laughs> <laughs> that naturally needs to be up on a pedestal. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you guys, for all you out there watching, if you plunge into Gaxmore, watch out for these statues. They <laughs> they can be dangerous. <laughs> and for yeah. those just tuning in, every time you're doing one of these seg every time you're adding one of these segments, that's about two hours of work. Is that what you were saying yes. earlier? Yeah, this is about two hours right here. Yeah. And you'll I notice did have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, when doing a map for a pre-written adventure, have you ever had to completely invent what a location looks like? Yeah. Oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, I, honestly, I think there was an element of that with Gaxmore. Like Stephen was saying earlier on, some of the locations here take up pages. Some of the locations are two lines. Um, and so there was a lot of that, particularly if I zoom in for a moment. Um, I was saying earlier on, Gaxmore has a very Rome influence. I mean, the amphitheater, the hippodrome. Um, and there's lots of other influences in there too. So I wanted, to, like, even if it's just listed as an abandoned villa. I was like, okay, so what, what am I gonna make this look like? And I want it to be unique, but I want it to feel Roman. And that's where things like this, and we had to do a lot of just drawing on a fly. This whole area here, like this is the barracks here. And I think on the original map, um, it's like this. So I was like, you know, no, we're, we're, we're gonna, we're really gonna reinvent this. So there's a lot of just, but that's a, that, honestly, they're the best assignments where there's certain parameters, I must have these buildings. Out of those, these buildings have a particular size or shape, you know, and I've got descriptions for that. The rest, go nuts. Those are the best assignments. Uh, I, I, lo I love having the parameters. I love having the, the framework of what I've got to achieve. But at the same time, I love the freedom to just then go absolutely crazy. And I'll, I'll throw this out there for any would-be or wannabe publishers. If you actually will let artists do that the end product's going to be much better it's it's going to be much better that's just all there is to it there, there's truth to that there's truth my um I, I want to say almost my worst assignments again not naming anything are those where i'm completely restricted and there's no creative freedom a little bit of creative freedom is a great uh, by the way just want to pull your attention Stephen, to this i'm not going to describe this building but this building has has a wonderful description. When I read it out on Twitch, people go, 
Oh, um, this tree here was not on the original map, but it is in the description. Interesting. So that's S18, I believe, right? Let's take a look. Uh, 19. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, but the tree is S18. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's funny it's not on the map because Peter drew this beautiful picture for it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a number. It's just a number. I was like, oh, no, the description is so good. I have to draw a tree there. Um, just, I'm going to skip. Now, we're going to start getting really close to the city core being done and start to show the coloring here. This area here is such a good location. And you're going to see, uh, I lavish some coloring on this later. This is described as an explosion where the epicenter was right here and it has just blown the buildings down. Talking about drawing rubble, Stephen. This was nuts. Rubble holla. <laughs> this is so much fun. I, I, there's something about, I mean, it has this very ink feel to it, which I love. There's something about the density of ink on white paper like that. that I, I, it gives me goosebumps, man. It, it, that just looks beautiful. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Someone in the stream mentioned Sergio Organis. He does that as well, too. Uh, it just has that. I don't know what it is. It's 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 the detail. And, you know, in, in, I guess in life, there's detail. And it's comforting to find it in art, too. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, are you strictly top down, or do you like or ever do isometric maps? I've, some I've maps done maps. some isometric, but it's not really my thing. I've done a little bit of isometric. I am. Um, I think isometric starts to get into almost traditional art in a way, and it's beautiful to look at. Um, but it starts to look more like a picture versus a map. And I kind of try to balance between them. So I've done a little bit. Uh, there was a product that I actually did recently, which I won't name, where I actually had to do a little bit of isometric work because it was um, Roman style. And they had done this funky sort of isometric. Um, so yes, I do a little bit of it. Um, all right, now I'm actually getting into the palace area. This one was blow by blow look at the original map, look at the numbers, read the numbers, and then draw it. But I wanted it to feel palatial, okay? I mean, I wanted it to almost have this French aristocracy with gardens and things, because I think a lot of those are actually in the description. Um, so this is where we netted out with this. I've got all of these gardens here. I love drawing gardens too, plant gardens. Uh, we've got some ruins here. We've got a water runoff here. This actually has a, 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 there's a named location too. And then I think we've got, oh, here, Stephen. Dead bodies. Because the description says there's a whole bunch of dead bodies at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and then here, I forget, what, uh, I think this is, uh, I, I, actually, I forget what, what this is, but it's like the guest palace or something like that. So I wanted to make this, uh, you'll notice here, I start actually, I'm keeping the original shape and everything that, that uh, was done earlier. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm just trying to make it feel palatial. I'm trying to make it feel opulent. You know, we've got balconies and things here. We've got big grand stairs coming up with like statues going all the way around there. And I think there's another barracks here too, if I remember rightly. Um, that ended up being... The, the one is the royal, the first one is the royal guest palace. Ah, okay, guest house, that's and it. The guard barracks is the one, the one next to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now, now we start getting into coloring. Um, this here is the finish of the black and white. And I mean, honestly, at this point you can say, okay, done. But I mean, the coloring is where it's at. And honestly, oh, wow. uh, coloring digitally is a lot easier for me and allows you to actually start doing color layers and that's the way i do it in my photoshop my ink is a top layer all my ink uh, is uh, is on the top and i color underneath that way the ink is sitting on the top of the actual coloring and i'll show you this now and it, it goes pretty quickly like two things here one is i'm just start coloring in with the green and i'm going to show you i add two more coloring layers to this and the shadow so about four layers on the trees and they just start to pop you'll also notice that i've got a shadow here on these aqueducts the aqueducts were not drawn on the original map 
So, but they're mentioned in the text. By chance, by chance, I picked a shadow of a very famous aqueduct in France. Because it's got this beautiful three tiers of arches in it. And you can see that, I've got that there. Which creates, I think, a a more visually pleasing shape, uh, shadow, instead of single arches. Single arches would have worked. I went with this one because I thought it was just so beautiful. And then, after I was done with this map, after I was coloured, there is somewhere in this book the very same aqueduct that I did a shadow for. And I saw this afterwards. And it, it was perfect. It was like it was destined to be. I did the right shadow. It was, it was perfect. I didn't think yeah, I told you that. That is awesome. <laughs> All right. So, here. Let me sort of zoom over here and out a little bit so everyone can see. I'm going to turn this off. We've got ink and coloring. Oh, wow. It, it, it transforms it. With the graveyard, by the way, some of these locations, in their description, they say what color the building is. So I made sure that it matched, um, if that was the case. You'll also notice I've started to add flagstone here. This is actually a brush uh, that a wonderful mystery created for me, and it is, it's just fantastic. It works out really well. I tend to colour my paths in a, a pale yellow on top of the green. This is, by the way, about seven layers of colouring. I'll basically start with a fairly light green or a brown if it's a muddy area. Then I'll come in underneath, I'll come in underneath... Vary the shade, and some areas just outright going more towards greys. And by the time you do that final darkest green or brown at the bottom, you end up with this. And there's this wonderful brush in Photoshop called Happy HB. And it just, that, the little details start to sort of bleed through. And when you sort of take a step backwards, it, then this is the net effect. It takes a while to colour, but I think the results are pretty good. And you'll see the his... good, yeah. I'd say. <laughs> yeah. What is the what? Are, what's the texture? Uh, I noticed when you zoomed in there that last time on the on the fields, there's a little bit of a texture there as well. What's the what's that? Well, it uh, look, almost looks like leaves or something like that. Well, and that's a beautiful thing. So in Photoshop, there was a brush called Happy HB. Um, oh, okay. And, you mentioned that. Okay. And it's almost if you are pretty gentle with it digitally, it's almost like using a spray brush. So if you imagine if you did a spray of brown and then you spray underneath with green, you still get a lot of white bleeding through because it's just like sure. spray of pixels. You do that a few times and then right underneath, maybe you solid uh, color it solid gray or something like that. That's what's just bleeding through. They were originally white. Then just right deep underneath, I've got that extra little bit of texturing. And I think that really, that's just my coloring style. You know, it's not particularly the best, but I like the net result. And this is our ruined area that we've got. And this all starts to then take shape. You can see we've got our gardens and things here. And I love that, by the way. I love the colouring process when you start having, like, the, the green. And I wanted to keep make sure I was sticking towards, like, the red um, type of roofs because it's Roman, again. Um, but you'll see that the, the green just pops. It just pops off the map. This was a lot of fun to actually colour. Uh, because this is this, this has a description and this has a description and if it looks like um, poo, well that's because this is a sewage uh, here that's running off and this was a lot of fun to colour on stream. <laughs> Let me tell you, more fun than it should have been. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit now so we can see that the, uh, the, the colouring beginning to pop into place. So here... Oh, see, yeah. Here, you can see that all my trees, I've got this solid colour of green. I do a highlight in the northwest corner. That's just where I uniformly sort of have my sun coming in. And then I'll do a darker green in the bottom right. And you'll see highlights up here, a little bit of shadow here. And I've got drop shadows underneath the trees as well. And so it kind of gives this nice elevation uh, to every single tree here. And you'll see that this 
same way, I just erred towards greys, a little bit of mud, um, a little bit of white on the ridges. If I zoom in, you'll see it here. And I'll do a little bit of shadow on this side of the drop. And then highlight the ridge, and you, you, you start to see the elevation, I think. You know, it's almost like a contour line, but nicer, you know. Oh. It works perfectly. This is a description too. I think, I'm not sure if you've got a picture of this, but the description des uh, describes tangled vegetation getting pulled in the, the water flow. So much fun coloring this type of thing on the map. It, it, this is the type of thing I love to do, Stephen. Well, that's going to be, that right there is brilliant. That's the stuff that people are going to absolutely love when they, when they read that description and they're playing the encounter mm -hmm. around it. And they're going to take a moment, they're going to look at the map, and they're going to go, holy crap. <laughs> it's actually in there. It, yeah, so here, I'm going to turn this on and off, too, so you can see. Here's the black and white that we spoke about before. This is the tannery area. And here it is colored. And I, I, I like doing occasionally, like, little awnings and stuff with stripes because it's that little spot of color. Um, I try to make sure that it looked like there was some overgrowth and stuff. This is, like, you know, abandoned. These, I don't think, are active workshops now. Um, but this kind of just starts to pop. And you'll notice that with all my buildings, I also put in a drop shadow on them. So there's this concept of this light hitting it from the northwest side and anywhere on the southeast side that's where i put my little shadow and now they actually look 3d they look three-dimensional i think now it seems like i was jumping around the map just coloring the bit that i want to color the most if anything i'm probably going clockwise at this point um We've got, I turned off my shadows because they were distracting me. So on um, some of them, you'll see the shadows get turned back on. Here, this is described as a marsh, as a swamp, with a water runoff going off into it. So that was actually a lot of fun to do. And then... Oh, so, yeah. And that's a, that's a uh, pretty distinct difference between this map and the uh, the original. I thought that was a water feature before, and it's, definitely, it's more clearly right. swamp in that. Yep. Right. And you can see that a kind of big jump here. I've got all of the trees colored up here. And I mean, at this at this stage, I think it's really beginning to come to life with the, getting these buildings done. Now here, so here's a good example. This is just like grayscale, or uh, uh, grayscale. This is our ink on uh, like a colored background. I've got my hills and everything colored, just as I said before. But then if we... This is then the orchard coloured. This is this building right here coloured. And this nice little flagstone courtyard right there. It just, I think it just, everything starts to really pop. These are the oh, tents yeah, that we spoke there. about before. I mean, look at this. And it really, and when you look at the shadows of that aqueduct, it really begins to pop out. Right. Oh, yeah. Also, there's our um, Coliseum, colored. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, it, it's, honestly, it, it amazes me when the coloring goes on, just how beautiful it, 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 everything starts to look. I used to actually really, really, really prefer my uh, black and white stuff, and the black and white is fine, but nowadays I want to color it, uh, you know, uh, because I, it just transforms it. It really, I mean, it guides your eye in the direction that you want it to go. Uh, shadowing is great, but at the end of the day, now I know distinctly what I'm looking at. Right, right. Now, there's going to be, I'm going to zoom in this later in a moment. This is a bathhouse. This, I'm, I was looking forward to coloring this bathhouse because of the description. It describes that what, uh, two baths have actually broken the, uh, their edges and the, the water's drained out into the surrounding area. Ever since I drew this one, Stephen, I was jonesing to color it. Um, here's, here's Jeffrey's pyramid. What an interesting take on a pyramid. So one of the guest writers actually told me um, how we wanted to have this colored, and this is how it ended up. That was awesome. <laughs> but now you've got, yeah. you've got a coloring on that bath and what you did with the tile on the floor. <laughs> 
So the, the story behind this bathhouse is, you know, it's got this great description and I think there were four pools and two of them have broke their banks, so to speak. They broke their walls and the water has run off. That's, you know, paraphrasing a description. I drew this. Now, I'm a Roman chick. I like Roman stuff. So I'm drawing this bathhouse and I'm like, oh, we're going to have fun with this. I'm going to do mosaics on the floor. We're going to have water in the tubs, except for two of them that have run out. We're going to have a nice little runoff in this area here. This I was so, so, so looking forward to getting into. Um, you will notice, too, that I've just basically started coming through all of the ruins, adding scuff and dirt to them. And then it's the individual ones that I'm jumping into here um, during the actual coloring process. That's just a close-up. Here. So that, then I started to come back through the, uh, I think these are like not even named buildings, but I just drew them on here. So I started actually getting the color on these. Again, I want to stay towards like the, the red sort of terracotta in style generally, but I've got different hues and variations of it. But I want it to feel Roman in that way. So I'm, I'm, I stay away from wood unless it's a shack of some description, and you'll see some of those on the outside here. Um, I typically will do golds and whites for the temples, and you'll see that happening. Otherwise, we're sticking with variations of terracotta. And here, you can see, because I actually put this little statue up on a plant, that's why, because I've got that white. This, I think, the actual description describes that it's actually all flooding out now, so I did the water spilling out, and it's running off in this direction, and it's coming down towards the slope here, and heading away. You did have a question on coloring. Yeah. Where did you learn your uh, coloring technique? Trial, how did you learn it? Trial and error. Honestly, trial and error. Um, there, there was a great guy that I used to work with. We were a little bit like Albert, uh, uh, others Owen Gossany, you know, Asterix, uh, the Gaul. One of them was uh, the actual um, writer and the other one would do the artwork. Um, both passed now, sadly. Um, but it was a great synergy and I had a colorist that I used to do I would do all of the ink work and he would color and he'd send this map back and I was like, wow that's so cool well he got a full-time job as you do and so I had to start doing it myself so I got a lot of inspiration from him uh, I wasn't happy with a few, uh, a few of my earlier maps but now now I'm getting I think pretty good results it's ponderous i start it's multi-layered um and sometimes i don't like the result and i'll start again but honestly it's just been trial and error it's just been trial and error um uh, steven these are these tents that you were talking about here oh yeah when, once you colored them they really jump out it's, it's 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 that little splash of color in an area of oranges and reds you might that little spot of green like where we've got some gardens with a path i tend to just like trace a little path in a faint yellow or something and like here's another one go and pass some color tents and i don't they just they just pop they just really pop off the map i love that it's it, it's actually something that i got if we're talking about where did i learn some coloring honestly part of the coloring approach i have I get from miniature painting. I went to a class once where the woman was talking about a contrast of textures or a contrast of colors. Um, and I apply a lot of that to here. My tents are part of that. I look for contrasts. I look for visual contrasts, whether it be in texture or it be in color, that m makes an area look interesting, that makes you want to actually, you know, zoom right down. I got a little bit of blood here at the bottom of the arena, you know? Um, but that, that's where I got it from, painting miniatures. So, yeah, and that might not be, or that might be a bit that some of the viewers don't, don't realize is that you do quite a bit of miniature painting as well. Uh, yeah. Spectacular miniature painting, I might add. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you. But I do miniature painting as a form of relaxation and I don't get to do it as much as I used to be able to do it. So I always make my Fridays, my painting night and i'm just trying to get better and so the my painting of miniatures is kind of helping my um cartography my cartography actually helps me over painting my miniatures here's our gardens um there's our water runoff right here that's in the description uh, this is a prison by the way so that's why i've kept it nice and dark and gray and ominous and dour um 
But then we've got our guest house here. We've got an barracks. So I wanted to keep the barracks as more of a neutral colour. There's all red. But these have got a scream, right? This is our palace here. They've got to pop off the map. So that's the only area where I've actually done like purple like this. And it was honestly just to make it go, pow, what is that? It looks palatial, you know? Hey, Elisa? Yes. You mentioned asterisks and obelisk, and since this is a, a Roman ruin, I can't get out of my head asterisks wandering through here now. <laughs> Being quite happy with the results. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've just got about six or seven more slides, so to speak, here. So here I'm going to, you can see that I'm making my way around and like just filling in these areas, filling in, you'll notice that I've got these little gardens in these courtyards that again, that contrast of green, maybe with some statues or something, just really sort of helps pop it off the map. You can see that I'm coming towards the bathhouse that I've been desperately wanting to get into and the amphitheater, which at the time, I wasn't sure how I was going to color it and I was a little bit scared. So it's like I'm coloring around these things. And then, right, this, this was a big jump, so I'm going to zoom in and into three areas. The burned out area here and the beginning of this here. So here, this is the explosion that leveled the buildings all uh, away. And I tried to actually colour it in strokes that make it feel like there was an explosion there. That debris has been thrown away. And you'll notice too that I've tried to pay attention to the surrounding buildings and where they would have taken some damage as well. Oh, and this here. All we've got left are the stone steps and there's nothing left up here. I would love that. It just it oh, yeah, tickles nice me. <laughs> that is a nice, yeah, that's a nice touch. Dyson, uh, Dyson's in chat there and he said he loves your work. Hey, Dyson. Right back at you, my friend. Love your work. So this, this is our bathhouse. Stephen, this is where I, I basically, I took some a, a mosaic of, I think it was a fish. Um, so we've got like this fish mosaic here, but then I actually did a transparent water on top of the mosaic. And here just, it's basically dried out water. It's like maybe a little bit left in the bottom of the pool. And then it's all come running out. This is like your description right here. And I think it made this area all marshy. That was so much fun to do, that bathhouse. <laughs> this is the amphitheatre. Um, the amphitheatre, I decided to actually have it be uh, grass-covered on the outside, um, but I did some, like, uh, like it, it like got covered over time and got some ivy, et cetera, growing up here. I decided to keep it simple on the interior um, because I, I felt like it might be a white marble, white marble steps um, and seats. But I put pillows uh, um, there because I think they used to sit on pillows. Oh, interesting. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to high res this map really big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I actually come up to the top here. Um, so I'm now sort of kind of getting in the final details. You can see uh, I'm pointing at the screen, like you know what I'm pointing at in this area here. Um, I got the granaries done. I got this building done. Again, notice the technique of just having these little garden areas. This nice visual contrast. Paths of a pale yellow in there. Uh, we've got our water now coloured in this aqueduct here. And I actually started to make sure that it looked like water flowing off the end of that. Now we've got our amphitheatre. Um, I wanted to make this look like it had been used. Or a hippodrome, I suppose it is. Um, so I've got like this, the worn path of the chariots in here, and it's not in the description, but then I've got a guy that clearly crashed out at the, on, on the corner there, and has been left there. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and then actually it started to get into labelling, uh, you know, I'm going to just zoom out here. Um, this, this is the final... I say final, there's going to be some additional layers, uh, labels to put in here. There might be a couple of tweaks. But this, this, you know, at the end of last year, it was 
the final piece. And you saw that we went from completely black and white, a blank slate. We took the original artwork. We kept the spirit of the outer walls. We kept the spirit of the main key locations and where they're at. If they have a certain size or an orientation or something, we kept that. We kept the shapes. But we then just added ours. We just put in our details right all the way around it. And then you saw that I just started coloring sections and layering them up a bit of a bit of a bit until this is the end result. Very quick. This is a description of a refuge pit and I don't think it's described as... No, it is described as burning. So I put some smoke coming away from that too because that was another <laughs> area that I was looking forward to working on because it looks dirty and grungy and like something smoldering over there you know well you definitely captured the ruined city look it was it, it was a lot of fun to work on it was a lot of fun to work on and um, then the next part is actually honestly the labeling um uh, I share um, a, a dislike for labeling, uh, as some other cartographers do, because you end up covering your map, and this has got a lot of labels on it. So I'm like, uh, I, I, this looks wonderful, and I'm just going to slap a whole bunch of numbers and stuff all over it, and there's hundreds of them. But I think we managed to find a pretty good balance where the labels actually add to the map. Um I, I chose to actually do my statue labels. The statues don't have a preceding A or C or S. They're just a number. But I decided to make them in yellow because I think they stand out a little bit. And you can sort of see, no, that's a statue. Um, and I decided to, we've got our little ABCs and S25s. This actually, honestly, when I was done, I was like, oh, no, actually, the labels have enhanced this map. And it was not something I was expecting to get. I, I thought it was going to end up just covering everything. And then, got to have a compass rose. So I thought, you know, this is a Roman city, so let's do an eagle here. I, I, I have the same compass rose that I use on all my maps. This compass rose in the background is the same. Then I always do some kind of design, a circular design in the front of it that matches the, uh, the map itself, whether it be a Medusa's head or, you know, Athena's head or something. This one I thought, no, we, we've, we've got to actually uh, do the whole Roman eagle there for the glory of Rome. And then we just got the Lost City of Gaxmore label up the top. This is now done. It, 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 I tell you, it's brilliant, and it's everything I asked you to do. And the funny thing about it, you know, we had, there's 40, 30 or some such submissions that weren't part of the book that you worked from, you know, the original Castles and Crusades version of it. Uh, and when I began feeding those to you, there was, I don't know, four or five of them that had special descriptions. But I'm pretty sure I was able to just look at your map and scroll through it and just find places that you had drawn on your own that worked perfectly for them. <laughs> so your, your level of detail actually went above and beyond <laughs> anything expected. Well, talk about detail then. Uh, you know, we were talking about, I like to add stories and personality to my map. There's no cutting and copying on this map. You've all seen that. Um, I have cut and copied. There's nothing wrong with that. But with a map like this, it's got a, it's just got a scream personality, right? And you don't get that by cloning something over and over and over. This was one of those locations. Um, I'm not going to name the location, but this was a prime example. It's like, okay, so we've just got a forest. And on the original map, it's just the forest. And I think it's just a big, huge block of green. Um, but on this one, we've got all of our little paths going through. I could imagine players actually tracing this with their fingers, figuring out how to get somewhere. And then we've got this in the middle of a clearing. I mean, what is this? What are these tents? Who, who is this here? I love adding things like that to a map and this map has got a lot of them the compass rose by the way was placed in a position where it doesn't cover anything like that but otherwise this map all over including right here well what is this in the middle of the, uh, the, the crossroads here it i don't know gm you tell me that that's what i i'd like to get i mean you'll see that we've even got these little paths that just go off to whatever you tell me what it is and this map is full of that type of thing so, yeah, with it having so much personality, Stephen, and your descriptions were so good, it, it was easy to do that type of thing. 
Now, to, to, to be clear, that I didn't write this. Luke and Ernie Gygax wrote this one. Fat. But uh, <laughs> the descriptions in the book. But that the, the nice thing about, and I don't know if this was, maybe this is just fated to be what you're talking about by adding detail that gives, it's not necessarily in the book, but it gives the GM things to run with. That's actually the spirit of Gaxmore, because when you go in there, it, like I mentioned earlier, it's really, the, the details of the history and all that stuff is very scant. That's really up for the GM. There's a group of orcs, there's a group of hobgoblins, there's all of these factions fighting. Well, you can take it and run with it. I mean, that's the whole thing. And what you've done, Elisa, here is taken that concept and in this perfect burst of synergy made it even better, made it work even more. So uh, I think people are going to love this thing through and through. This and is I think that's the most repeated comment in chat as well as how much personality you've given the map since, uh, especially, particularly after going over and describing each of the sections. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. I, I actually, I, I don't like to work on maps where I can't add a certain amount of personality, right? But if I'm going to draw a city map, I want you to be able to easily picture, you know, walking down here, past the barracks on your left, we've got a stable off to our right, I can see the gatehouse in my mind's eye, and as I come out of the palace grounds behind me, which you'll notice are way less ruined than anywhere else in the city, I can see the Hippodrome off to my left, but I've got this greenhouse here. Um, and I, I want to be able to see that in my mind, you know. Uh, and that wasn't a part of the description either, but I really want to give players and GMs visual fodder to work from, you know. Uh, that That's everything to me. I, I, want, I want players to sit there and go, uh, oh, there's, a, oh, there's a whole bunch of tents. So, so who's in the tents then? And like... Go. Well, I go up to this multicolored one right at the end here. You know, that I want to add those stories. I think me being a GM and a writer for 30, 40 years or so has helped. I try to funnel that into my maps. People are calling for this map to be released. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. No. <laughs> I think backers should have it, though. I think I've sent it to the backer. No, we haven't, because we still have some... I still got to send you some place numbers to put on it. You got to send me some place numbers. We'll get them dropped on there. Uh, but, Stephen, I, honestly, I, I think it was so good that you could actually join me today. I'm actually really, really appreciative of it, because this is your map, right? This is for Gaxmore. This is your product. These are for your backers and your customers. So you and I being able to walk through this together and for them to be able to see it, I think is honestly perfect. Well, thank you for thank you for hollering at me and having me on. And it's really, honestly, it's really nice to watch you do this, to see your kind of methodology, because as I've mentioned to you in a, a number of private texts, I really want to do more work with you. So <laughs> I know I keep bugging you quite a bit. <laughs> well, we've got something coming up, I think, right? From the Kickstarter you've got going on right now. Very excited about that. And I've got an idea. I, I'm going to... I'm going to make it mature in my head, but I've got a good idea that I think we can do here in the future. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, so I think we've got a couple of minutes. I know they'd like us to end about 10 minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, are there any questions from anyone for the next five minutes or so? Steve, when are you going to reopen the Kickstarter? There was a couple of comments. Okay. So what this was done originally as a Kickstarter about a year ago, and we're, we were converting it from castles and crusades to fifth edition. It did extraordinarily well. And we are in layout. Uh, the map is finished other than giving Elisa a few uh, place names we've got to put in there. And we've got to put, uh, I think all of this stuff is in the book except art and maps. Uh, so once those go in, we'll kind of build it. I'm hoping it's done in about six weeks, four to five, six weeks. As soon as it's done, as soon as I'm happy with that we're like 95% ready to go to print, we will open this up in backer kit. And if you miss the Kickstarter, you can jump in on the backer kit and purchase it that way. And it'll let you get whatever level you want. If you don't want to do any of that, uh, it'll be out in a few months. So we'll ship it to backer kit. Usually what we do when about half of it, half of the backers, it's in the mail, we'll open it up on the website so you can purchase it on the website. That's great, actually, Stephen, that you're reopening that up. You're going to put it on back kit. That's fantastic. Let me know when you do that, because I've had a lot of people interested in this as well. So I, I would love to be able to point them to it and say, well, now you can get it. Excellent. Yep, yep. Well, it, hopefully in about five or six weeks. I think you might also have an audience for that 50-inch map, the 50-inch version. 
that you were going to send over. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did. So I did. Uh, basically, Noble Dwarf handles uh, my uh, canvas printing. Um, they do an absolute fantastic job. And honestly, these maps on canvas are so rich. And and I think I did um, just a few of these at a super large size for people like Stephen. Um, but if there is uh, obviously a, an interest, um, I will defer to Stephen for him working with Noble Dwarf and maybe making something available to you folks. Yeah, let's definitely talk about that. That'd be fantastic. Uh, Dyson was asking about the um, DPI that you work with. It's, I think you said 600 before, or is that? Between 300 and 600, depending on the map and what size I want the net results to be. Uh, I try not to do 600 too much, especially on really big maps, uh, because it could be a real resource hog. Um, but at least 300. Uh, 300 is my standard, because if you think about it, most of my maps are going into a book. So I'm thinking sort of 8.5 by 11 sort of aspect ratio. I don't need to go much larger than that. I've tended to now start drawing, though, at double the size, because it will shrink down a little bit. Um, and at least 300, because it will actually blow up a little bit. You can get a small poster out of it easily. So, uh, And then if I work on something like Axmore, I'll increase it even further. And then one last question that I saw anyway, do you ever curve text? And if so, Photoshop or Illustrator? Curved text? Photoshop will do it now, actually. It didn't used to, but you can actually use the pen tool to map out a curve. And then if you take the text, you can actually click on the end of that path and it will actually curve. So, and it works. I should probably work in Illustrator way more than I do, but you know, it's just tools that you're familiar with. Uh, Illustrator is great for that type of thing, but Photoshop will do it nowadays as well. All right. I think that's all the questions I see there, other than the ton of comments on how useful and uh, inspiring and beneficial this was. Uh, I think, uh, how do you scale your maps? One last question. How do you scale your maps? I think you covered that earlier, but for those... Yeah, so uh, I will always... I did it on this map, and uh, I've done it on... Uh, I'm doing it right now on a map called Light Harbor. Um, what am I doing? Am I doing a village? Am I doing a hamlet? Am I doing a thorpe? Am I doing a small town, a large town, a metropolis? How much information do I need to get on the paper in the area that we're working with, right? Um, this it, I wouldn't describe this as a metropolis, but it's certainly, you know, a, a reasonable sized city. So that starts to dictate... Um, like if, if, if it's a small hut, going to be about 10 feet across, probably uh, a medium residence, maybe 20 to 30 feet, probably not much larger than that, depending on the area we're drawing within. I will actually then draw several buildings of those key sizes and draw a scale bar next to them. I say, okay, this looks too small, so let's make it a little bit larger. This looks about right for a small town. What is this? I'm going to say that this is my 30 foot mark. So I'll, I'll kind of use that, the visual balance and how much I need to get into the map to dictate my size scale. And then I actually create a scale from that. Gaxmore was a little bit different. Gaxmore came with a scale. Here's your map, Alyssa. This is the one we did, you know, about 20 years ago or so. And it had a scale on it. So what I ended up doing is I took that scale and I made my buildings. I drew my buildings next to it. I'd literally move my scale around. And so like something like this here, I think actually has a description of let's say 50, 60 feet or something like that in length. I put my scale bar next to it, you know, and rotated it and go, okay, so 60 feet it is. Um, and then I would just judge based off that for what other buildings should be in relative size. I once, in, what, in my career as a cartographer, I once screwed up and it was a metropolis and my buildings were too small. Uh, way too small and the client didn't want it because of that and there were lots of hours in there and after that I learned develop a scale oh I drag the scale around keep saying you know have I drawn this too large have I drawn it too small what does my scale bar say uh, 40 feet in length okay, it's a reasonable size house so that's how I use it uh, I, I know I said one more question but this one I, I have a little bit of insider knowledge on uh, as far as your rig so people were saying that you know they it, People that don't have experience with it know that it takes quite a while or have heard rather that it takes quite a while to render stuff. So what kind of system are you using? Okay. Um, 
I don't have to do the rendering of Anna Meyer. Anna Meyer has a ridiculous wig, but then she needs to, right? Uh, I'm hand drawing this, or, or almost in a very similar sort of Dyson, you know, ink on paper. That was how I started. So all, all I need is something. I mean, I could use GIMP, you know, a free graphics program for that. As long as I can do my layers, as long as I can get pen sensitivity, I'm good. Now that said, I do want it to emulate ink on paper as much as possible. And so what I've got, is, I'll tip this up momentarily so you can sort of see. This is a, um, a Cintiq 24-inch HD Touch. They now do them about 32, 34 inches in size. They're huge. It's a monitor. It's a monitor that will stand up and then just lie flat. It comes with a stand where you can just lie it flat. So I can literally just draw in Photoshop using a pen. Um, I've got plenty of RAM in here because Photoshop does like memory. Um, I think it's only about 32 or 64, something like that. And um, a good graphics card. But outside of that, and two monitors. Because this one light is lying flat. That, that's it. Otherwise, it's not particularly special. Sure. Okay. Well, I think we're uh, we're at the end of our time. So I certainly appreciate the both of you uh, coming out and going over the lost city of Gaxmore, both from a uh, historical perspective as well as what went into the map. So, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for taking time out on Sunday to come out and do this. And uh, Elise, thank you very much again for, for covering. That is amazing. And I know that everybody that was watching has a, has a lot of positive things to say about it. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, thanks for hosting all of this. And thanks for putting Virtual Gary Con on in like 10 days. I mean, that is a, <laughs> <laughs> a monolithic thing that you guys have done. Yeah, it was about yeah about ten days. It's it's been a wild ride, and Luke has Luke has commented on the stats a couple times. We had, I think, twenty games and a hundred hundred virtual badges before the announcement of the con uh, cancellation. And I just checked this morning, and we've got twenty or two thousand twenty wow. badges. Wow! And we had over six hundred games last time I checked. But yeah, it's it it <laughs> ramped up very fast. Thank you, Casey. You did a great job. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, this is, uh, I think, the last. Nope, that's not true. In two hours, we are going to have uh, live from Seattle. It's Sunday night uh, with Stephen Corny, uh, Stefan Pacorny, rather, of uh, Dwarven Forge. That'll be coming up at 6 o'clock Central, so 4 o'clock Pacific for those of you out there. And that's going to be uh, him running a first edition D&D game for six players, kind of a uh, theater of the mind style theater of the mind style uh, session. So tune in for that here in just a couple hours. And uh, if you are interested, they are going a little bit longer on the Wizards of the Couch show. They're going to continue that game since there's no show following them. And that's the trouble of uh, Locke Geneva with Game Master Jeff Talanian and uh, Luke Gygax is one of the players. Oh, so I think uh, we'll probably raid from here. And I again, thank you both of you very much for, for coming out and we'll call that a call that a wrap. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gary Khan. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank you for the Lost City of Gaxmore.